All right. So uh, since I cannot be in class today, I am recording the lecture. The first thing is it has to do with the program that you have to write, um, the negative exponent program. Um, you will need to know what is the largest integer value of an unsigned 64-bit integer. So to do that, to find that constant, you can go to uh, stdint.h. I mean, Google search for the header file. And once you get to the header file, there are specific constants to refer to the largest value of um, a particular integer, integer type. So um, you can search through you know, this document here. Uh, it talks about you know, all the types. And here we have a UN64 underscore T, which is the type of a 64-bit unsigned integer. <clears throat> And then they have also um, some other types, but we are not looking for types because what we are doing is we're looking for um, limits. So that means you know, we're looking for these particular things. And you know, here's one that is going to be useful because u int n, and n is italic, underscore, underscore max is referring to the largest value that you can represent using n bits for an unsigned integer. So this n is italicized because it is actually ref referring to the width of the unsigned integer. So I will leave it up to you to choose you know, how you want to do this. So that's one thing. And then the other thing has to do with um, the equation uh, or, or, or how you can compare and see if you have you still have room for another multiplication by two. So to demonstrate that, I am going to use mouse pad, <coughs> and I have to move it into view. There you go. All right. So the idea is you have to determine uh, whether you can multiply the coefficient by two or not. So you basically want to detect this. You know if. Um, twice of the current coefficient is continuing to be less than or equal to um, the maximum you know, value you can store in a 64-bit integer, then you can go ahead and you know, then double, you know, C. But the problem is, you know, um, every integer has to be less than or equal to the maximum because that's the definition of the maximum. So the key to do this is to divide both sides by 2. So you'll be comparing C to the maximum divided by 2. But then it also complicates a little bit more because um, we have a plus 5 um, after, uh, before we do a division by 10 because that's how we do the rounding. So that means uh, when you add 5 to the coefficient, it should also still not overflow. <clears throat> so that means you, know, you have to subtract 5 first before you divide it by 2 in and if it is if c is still less than or equal to this value then you can uh, multiply it by 2 which means it is at the most your max minus 5 that will give you the room to add 5 before you have you divide it by 10 you know for the rounding mechanism so these are uh, additional tips for your homework assignment uh, the programming assignment that i believe is due on Thursday. All right, so this is done. And oh, and also the sample log is going to be helpful because it, it really shows you how the coefficient and also the exponent of 2 as well as the exponent of 10 should be updated as your program proceeds. So that's going to be helpful. And now we can proceed to the actual topic for today. All right, so let me get rid of this. All right, so what we have here, okay, the first thing I want to do is to kind of go back to um, the uh, carry look ahead adder. And specifically, we want to look at how we compute K2. So we can see how K2 is G1 or P1 G0 or P1 P0 K0. So we have done this circuit already. Um, and now we want to analyze, you know, um, the propagational delay, you know, what can change at the same time and what cannot change at the same time. So what we have here is a spreadsheet like this, and this is uh, Google Sheets, and the way it is, the circuit is represented here. So I, I would need to kind of explain, you know, what, how to read this particular sheet. 
First of all, um, row two is going to tell you uh, what kind of component we have in the circuit. So P0 is an input pin, P1 is an input pin, so it's G0, G1, and K0, because they all have the type of an input pin. They correspond to the square uh, input pin in LogiSim. And then we have A1 being a AND3 you know, type object. Uh, that means A1 has three input as an AND gate, A2 has two inputs as an AND gate, and then O1 is an OR gate with three inputs. Um, and then we have a K2 as an output pin. So that's basically what row two is for. It is for declaring um, what type of a component in a circuit do we have. And then row three <coughs> is designating the, the port of a particular component. So with input pins, you know, it's really Im simple because input pins really don't have anything um, to process. You know, all it is representing is a particular a value that the end user can specify, you know, or from the outside. So they only have quote unquote port. Uh, that's the only connection point to the input pins. And then the output pin is kind of the same thing. It only has one single connection point because the whole purpose of the output pin is to reflect the, the result after some kind of uh, computation. Or it can also be seen as a pin on a particular chip um, when we turn the circuit into a um, into its own component. What makes it a little bit more complex is AND3. <clears throat> so AND3 is a three input uh, gate, uh, and as a result it has IN, 0, IN1, IN2, and I use the array notation here. This one is malformed, so it's IN2, okay, like that. So it, I use the array notation, you know, just because, you know, it really behaves like an array. We have three input pins, and it has one single output pin. And to, you know, A2, meaning, you know, A2 is the name of a two input AND gate. It has two input pins, IN0 and IN1, and one single output pin. And then with OR3, O1, meaning, you know, O1 is the name of a three input OR gate. It has three input pins, one, two, and three, and then one single output pin like that. So instead of drawing the circuit, the way the connectivity is specified here is by node ID. So that will be row 1. So all the columns with the same number, they are electrically connected. So that means uh, this column here, which is um, P0, is connected to all the other columns with a 4 in it. And we can see how you know this column and this column are the only ones with node ID of four, and so they are connected, electrically connected, but they're not connected to anything else, just between these two. Now, there are also connections that have more than two connection points. Let me go find one that has multiple connection points. Two is one, okay, so you can see how two, or node ID two, is used here, and here, and also here. So these three ports, are connected. Um, in other words, P1 is connected to one of the inputs of the AND3. It is also connected connected to one of the inputs of the AND2. Now that makes sense because when you look at the equation of K2, we can see how P1 is referred here as well as here. Now the ordering is not important, you know, so we are not we don't have to follow exactly the same order here in terms of you know in zero and in one. But you can definitely tell that P1 needs to be in both of these places. And then the third one is referring to P1 as its own input pin, because in this particular design, we are not using multi-bit pins. We are sing we're using single-bit pins, and there are five of those. Um, in other words, you know, basically what this thing here is, what this table is, is it's basically a way to specify a circuit if you are only considering uh, this portion here. It is specifying, you know, a circuit, much like uh, in LogiSim, we can draw out a circuit. This is just a text representation of a circuit. So what we're going to do next is we're going to try to analyze uh, what is going to happen when we change um, some of the input pins. So the input pins, you know, everything starts with unknown values, and that's why they're all question marks. In other words, we're not making any assumptions as to um, what is a one and what is a zero. They all start with unknown. 
And the first thing we do is typically we change uh, one or more of the input pins. So in this case, uh, we can go ahead and change you know, some of these. So I'm going to put a 1 here, a 0 here, a 1, a 1, and a 0 over here. And these are just kind of, I ch chose these to be kind of random. Now, this is ANSI, which stands for Node Connectivity. In other words, you know, in this particular phase, what we want to do, <clears throat> and I'm going to both phase these. Give me a second here. Okay, so anything that is both phased means, you know, it is a change from what it used to be because these were all, you know, unknown, you know, prior to this. So what we need to do now is to, is to ask the question, what else is electrically connected to node 4? So we have this node here, um, excuse me, we have this port here, which is also connected to 4. So that also needs to get the same value as this one over here. So we copy a 1 over here. And then we ask you know, what um, what is the connectivity of node two? Okay, so this is node ID two, so we can see that it is supposed to also connect here. So we copy the value of zero over here, and then we look at node three. Node three is connected to here, so this copies the one over, and then we have um, node one. And node 1 is used all the way here. It has a value of 1. So then we put a 1 over here. And then we have node 5. And node 5 is used over here. It has a value of 0. So the 0 value is going to be copied over here. All right. So this is the node connectivity um, step, which basically means, you know, if one of the ports connected to a single node changes its value, we need to follow the node connectivity to update all of the other ports that are electrically connected to uh, the node that has the value changed. So that's node connectivity. <clears throat> and then the next step is called PD, which is a propagational delay. And the way we do it here is to identify which component, which gate basically in this case, has its input changed. So we can see that, you know, with um, N, uh, A1, uh, out of the three input pins, okay, let me highlight the three input pins here. So out of the three input pins of A1, one is changed right here. So now we have to evaluate and see whether the output should be changed or not. And I think I made a mistake somewhere because, you know, we cannot have an output pin connected to one of the input pins because they want to both uh, specify the um, outcome. So I believe this output is not supposed to be a 5. So I need to backtrack. So sorry about that. Um, let, me <clears throat> let me redo all this part here. I'm going to erase all of this. All right. So let's figure out you know, where this is supposed to go. This is the output of the AND3 gate. It is supposed to connect to one of the inputs of the OR gate here. Um, all right, so this one is good because it connects to G1. And then 6 is the output here, so that is good. And then 7, okay, I see what the problem is. Um, this is supposed to be 7 which also means you know, this one is not supposed to be a 7. And um, for the 3 input AND gate, it is supposed to get P0, P1, and K0. So we can see that K0 is not referenced anywhere, uh, whereas P0, P1 are already referenced. So I think this is supposed to be the 5 here. Okay, so I do apologize that I made a mistake in terms of the connectivity. So let's redo the whole thing. With node connectivity, you know, with this face here, what we are doing is we are identifying the other ports connected to the same node and update all of those to have the same value. So um, this port here connects to node 4. So now we have to look for all the node 4 connected ports and make sure they all update to the same value of 1. So this port here is going to be updated here. And then this refers to node 2. So node 2 is connected here as well as here. So we have a 0 copied here as well as a 0 copied over here. Node 3 has a value of 1. And then the only thing that connects to node 3 is uh, G0 as a port as well as in 1 
of the two input AND gate. So that is going to get a 1 because the value of 1 here is copied over here. <coughs> and then we move on to um, uh, K0, which is uh, node 5. And this one we just worked on a little bit earlier. So it's going to go here. All right. So now we are ready for the propagation delay you know, step. So the propagation delay step needs to analyze uh, which one of the... Um, which component, which gate, you know, has the input changed. So we can see that, you know, this is referring to the three input AND gate. And we can definitely also see that in the previous NC step, all three inputs are changed. So that means, you know, with a PD, we need to try to figure out what the output is supposed to be. Now, fortunately, in this case, um, we have all three input pins, you know, determined. So that means that you know, we can now actually calculate the output. Uh, 0 and 1 and 0 is a 0, so we put a 0 here. And then with um, A2, it's the same thing because we can see how the inputs of uh, A2 are also changed at, at the same time. So the output is also going to be a 0 in this case because it's a regular AND gate. 0 and 1 is a 0. Um, and that's the entire propagational delay step. Because you know there are only three components here that can that serves as a, as a gate. There's AND three, you know A one, which is the a three input AND gate. A two is a two input AND gate, and then uh, O one is a three input OR gate. Now the OR gate is not updating in this step just yet because none of its input is altered. You know because of the NC step, the node propagation, uh, excuse me, node connectivity step here. So since you know the PD step you know resulted in some changes here, so that means you know we have to conduct another NC. So this time with the next NC or node connectivity step, we look up the previous PD. Okay, we look up the previous you know, uh, <coughs> propagational delay step here, and we can tell that um, node seven is getting changed um, because the output of A one connects to node 7. So that means you know, everything that connects to node 7 also need to be updated to a 0. Node 7 is only connected here. So this gets a 0 over here. Um, I believe that I missed something else here. OK. I missed something else here because I skipped over this pin in the NC step. So this pin, which is connected to node 1, needs to be connected to node 1, which is updated um, in the NC step here. Okay, but um, it's not going to update anything because um, in the previous uh, PD step, because in the pre in the PD step, um, it's going to be okay. Let me kind of go back here. So in the P PD step, it, it is still unknown because if you do if you're dealing with a oh okay never mind because if you're dealing with the or uh, if at least one input is a one, the output is going to be a one. So that's why you know we have to do it like this. Um, let me kind of back step a little bit here. Uh, what I forgot was this node here also connects to this um, port over here. And it is one of the input ports of the three input OR gate. So in the PD step following, <coughs> we look at all the um, gates that has at least one of the input pins changed. And this OR gate has one of its input pins changed. Even though there's just one, the other two are still unknown. But because it's an OR gate, if one input is known to be a 1, then the output is already guaranteed to be a 1. So we can actually determine the output at this point. <coughs> All right. So now uh, we still have, we're not done yet. We're not done yet because in this particular PD step, we have the output of A1 being changed to 0, and that belongs to node 7. So now, in the next NC step, which is node connectivity step, we have to take the uh, update of node 7 and make sure that we update every port that connects to node 7. So we this one, and then the same thing over here, because uh, the output of the two input AND gate is also updated to a 0. It is connected to node 6. So now we have to look up everything that connects to node 6. So as it turns out, in one of O1 also connects to 
node 6, so that also would update to a 0. <coughs> and then this one here is connected to node 8, so that means the output pin is now updated to a 1. So now we are done with the NC step, because you know, we only have two um, of the... Oh, never mind. So this is not going to be updated here, but it's going to be updated here. Because um, if you're using the node ID for um, to determine what needs to change, um, you only need to update... <coughs> you, okay, let me back up a little bit here. Any updates because of node connectivity is going to go, it's only going to update in an ANSI step. And in the previous step, which is a propagational delay, that changed the output of the O1 gate, but the connectivity uh, or the update because of the connectivity of the node is belongs to the next step, which is the NC step. And that's why this one is copied over here because they are both connected to node 8 in the following step, which is the NC step here. All right. So now the next question is, do we have any um, additional updates to do? In other words, you know, do we have another PD step over here? So now the question is, after the NC step, are we changing um, the inputs of any of the gates? So we look up here, okay? So we look up, you know, uh, A1, and in A1, <coughs> In the previous NC step, none of its input get changed. So the output is maintained to be a zero, but it's not an update. The same thing applies to N2, because in the previous NC step, which is in row seven, we can also see that none of the input of A2 got changed. And as a result, the output is going to remain as a zero. It is not an update. We do not change anything in the table unless it is an update. So the next one is going to be O1. So O1 has three inputs. So these are the three inputs. And then we look up the previous NC step, which is row seven. And we can see that two of the input pins are now changing, or they, they just got changed from an unknown to a zero. So that means we have to recalculate the output here. And in this case, um, because it's an OR gate, so one or zero or zero is still a one. And we do not write a one here because you know this value is already the the correct value or the you know it's it has no actual output change, so we don't make a note here th that it is a one. So that means you know, for this particular PD step here, there are no additional updates, and at this point the circuit is known to be in a steady state, which basically means there are no further updates. All right, so let's go ahead and change this a little bit. Um, just so that we can see, you know, how to work with uh, this type of setup. <clears throat> so in the next step here, let's just say that, you know, I change, you know, G1 from a 1 to a 0. So uh, the, the rest of the pins are maintained. In other words, they're not changed. Only this one is changed to a 0. So when I change the input um, pin, the state of an input pin, I'm going to use a bold face here, just so that I remember. Now, in this particular node connectivity step, um, I only have this one single node to update, which is node one. So now I have to locate all the node one here. There's only one uh, other port that connects to node one, which is this guy here. So that particular port is also going to change to a zero because these two, uh, input pin G1 and input pin you know, in zero of the OR gate O1, are connected electrically. So that's what we are doing you know, with the NC step is to say, if one of the ports connected to the same node is changed, we have to update all of the other ports of the same node. And then the next step here, you know, which is a propagational delay, we are going to analyze you know, um, which gate potentially would have changed its output. Um, and the way we do that is to look at the input pins of all the gates and see which gate has its input pins changed. So we'll start with uh, A1 again. And A1 has three input pins. These are the three input pins of A1. And we can see that the NC step of row nine did not update anything for M1. So M1 is gonna maintain its output of zero. We don't have to, we don't have to write anything here. Then we proceed to analyze A2, which is 
<coughs> excuse me, the same thing. Because the two input pins of A2 are these two pins here. And we can also see that on row nine, uh, there are no updates to these two input ports of A2. And as a result, the output is going to remain as a zero. And since it's remaining as its current value, we do not write anything here because we only write when there's an update. And now we're moving on to O1, which is a three input OR gate. And the three inputs of the OR gate are these columns here. And we can see that you know, on row nine, one of the input got changed with O1. And as a result, we have to recompute the actual output of O1. And in this case, we now have zero or zero or zero. So the output is now a zero. It had an output of one before, but it is now changed to a zero. So that's why I have to write a zero here because it is an update from what it used to be. And that concludes you know, the PD step. You know, Basically, we have already analyzed all of the gates in this particular circuit and we have identified which one has w at least one of the input pins changed and we computed the output of that gate and updated you know the output of that gate already so the next step is nc again which basically look at the previous row which is a pd and ask okay did anything change in the previous step and the answer is yes we have at least the one port being changed this is the only port this is the port being changed so the ANSI step will take a look at the connectivity of this port here it connects to node 8 and the other oh the, the only other port connecting to node 8 is the output pin of k2 so that means you know, this now needs to be updated to a zero and then what we do is we go through another PD again. So once again, when you go through a PD or propagational delay step, what you're doing is you're looking through all of the gates and see if any of the gates had its input changed because of the previous NC step. So in this case, we can see with um, A1, none of its three input got changed in the previous NC step. So we don't have to do anything with A1. A2 is the same way because the previous NC step did not update any one of the two inputs of A2. So we are going to maintain the output of A2 just like before. And now we move on to O1, same thing. Um, with the previous NC step, we look up and see that none of the input of O1 is changed. So you know, O1 gets to maintain its output, which is a zero. So that means you know this entire PD step it's going to give us an empty row here, which also means now we have reached a steady state. So we'll do it like one more time, you know, just to make sure that we understand how to get this to work. So this is PD. There we go. All right. So if you um, run into problems, like you know, because of the scrolling issue, I don't think you will. Um, you can always use this tool here, and the way this tool works is you can. Um, basically, you know, drag the bar here so you can scroll one part of the screen without scrolling the other part. It makes it a little bit easier to kind of refer to the previous state, um, but you pretty much really need to kind of look at you know, the entire column and um, with a larger screen because this is a uh, 720p resolution uh, recording. So I'm, I don't have as much a real estate as you would have on your own computer. So that's kind of the deal here. All right, so this is the steady state of the previous step. So on the next one, I'm going to change one of the, or you know, at least one of the inputs of the, uh, change the state of at least one of the input pins. So let me see which one I want to change here. So we are going to change both of these two to ones. So I want this one to be now a one, and this one also now to be a one it's already a one before so I just have to make a change to a change to this one over here so once again you know the boat phase um, cells are reflecting uh, changes to the input pins and that's where we start the propagation of changes is we always start with a change of the input pins all right so the NC step is also going to look at the um, all the nodes connected to the one input pin that just got changed. So this particular port connects to node two and node two connects to two additional places, which are here. So both column I and column K need to be updated 
to this value of one at this point. So I just have to be quite careful here to make sure this is now a one and this is now a one because of all of these, okay, these three columns, one, two, and three, they are all connected to node two. So when I update you know, this one, I also have to remember to update the other two. And now we get into the PD step. So the PD step, once again, is looking through all the components and see whether there's a component or gate that has at least one of its inputs you know, changed. So we can see that in this case with A1, okay, the input pins of A1 are these three columns. And we can see in the previous NC step, one of them got changed. So that means we have to recompute um, A1 and see if the output has changed from before. So in this case, um, the inputs are now 0, 1, and this one over here. These two remain the same as before. Okay, nothing changed these two, but you know, in two just got changed to a one because I changed you know the one of the input pins to a one. That's why this got changed to a one. But when you have zero and one and one, it is still a zero. So we do not put a zero here because it, it is not a change from what it used to be. So this zero is maintained and we don't basically write another zero here because otherwise we cannot tell whether uh, we have reached a steady state or not if we keep you know, writing numbers when there's actually no change. So, um, so A1 is done because even though one of the input pins of A1 got changed, the output did not change. And as a result, in the PD, on the PD row, there's no entry here corresponding to the output of A1. What about A2? Okay, so we look at the inputs of A2. These two columns are the inputs of A2. One of them got changed, okay? So that means we have to reevaluate the output of A2. So right now, A2 has one and one as its input, and because it's an AND gate, the output should be a one at this point. So I should put a one here. But before I put a one here, I have to make sure that this value, the new value of one, is different from what it used to be. So I look up the column and the previous one was a zero. And as a result, I do need to put a one here because it just got changed. And then we analyze the you know, O1. O1 has three input pins. Okay, let me highlight the three columns. And none, none of these three columns got changed because of the previous NC row. So as a result, I do, I do not have to reevaluate um, the uh, OR gate O1 and you know, there's no update over here. So that concludes you know, the, the propagational delay. We know that we are not done yet because as long as the PD row has at least one change, that means that we have to go for another NC row. So now we go for the NC row over here, which is basically looking at the PD row and ask um, you know, anything that got updated because of the PD row now needs to, we need to use the connectivity of the nodes to update all of the other ports that are electrically connected to things that are updated in the previous you know, PD step. So we look at the PD step, the only thing that got changed was uh, the output of A2. We look up the node connectivity, it is connected to node 6. So node 6 is here and also here. So that means in the NC step, we update um, the second input of the OR gate to also be a one, like so. And that's the only thing we need to do because you know, that's the only uh, item in the PD step here that got changed and it only has uh, connectivity to one other port, which is um, one, the, set, the middle input of the O1 gate here. So we have an update here. So now we switch to, um, so that's an NC step. So now we switch to a PD step, which is basically looking at the previous NC step and ask, okay, did we change the input of at least, at, did we change at least one of the inputs of a gate here? The answer is yes. This one is corresponding to the input of the OR gate here. And now we have to reevaluate the output of uh, the only OR gate in this circuit here. So that means that we potentially have to update you know, this out here. Um, so what we do is we look up what is in zero. So in zero of O1 was a zero, that still is a zero. In one is now a one, in two is still a zero from before, 
but since you know this is an OR gate, if at least one input is a one, the output is going to be a one. So now before I write a one here, I also have to make sure that you know that got changed from before. So it was a zero before, so now it is a one, it is a change, and that's why I have to you know, write down that one over here. And then we go for another NC over here. So this NC step here, once again, is looking at the previous PD and ask, did we change you know, one of the outputs of at least one of the gates? The answer is yes, we changed one of them. The output of the OR gate just got changed. So in the NC step, we look at the connectiv connectivity of the output of the OR gate and try to figure out you know, which uh, other port also need to be changed because they connect to the same electrical node. So in this case, you know, it is node 8, and the other thing that connects to node 8 is um, the output pin of K2. So that means you know, we're going to put a 1 over here. And that's the only thing, because you know, this particular um, port connects to node 8, and node 8 is only connecting um, the output of the OR gate to the output pin. So we now conclude the NC step here, and now we have to go for another PD step. <coughs> Just like before, the PD step is looking at the inputs of of the gates here. So uh, we look at the uh, inputs of um, A1, and we can see that there's there are no updates here. So that means you know, there's no going there's not going to be an output change you know, with A1. A2 is the same way. These two columns did not get updated because of the previous NC step. So as a result, the output is also not going to be changed. But um, uh, let's look at uh, O1, which is the OR gate. So now we look at all the input pins of the O1 OR gate, and then we use the row um, NC to see if anything got changed. And uh, there's nothing here that got changed. Okay, these three cells are all empty, which means you know, there's no change. So as a result, you know, this PD step is going to maintain the current value as the output, which we do not write. And that concludes you know, the analysis of all of the gates. So uh, as a result, you know, this particular PD step is also going to be empty because there are no updates whatsoever with this step here. So I hope this kind of illustrates you know, um, the way we track changes when we um, work on a circuit. There are, there's a module specifically to talk about this. It's a really short module, but nonetheless, you know, it is written so that you can try to understand, you know, the concept. So if you go all the way to the von Neumann, you know, module, in case okay, so it's going to be all the way down, 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 and you look at, you know, tracking change propagation, this is a really short module that talks about just that. So the first thing is it introduces the terms. A port is a point of connection of a component, um, such as you know, the input pins of a, the inputs of a gate or the output of a gate you know, or a wire. Excuse me, not a wire, but an input pin or an output pin. A node, on the other hand, is a collection of wires that are electrically connected. They can also be connected because of the use of tunnels. Um, so anything that connects to the same tunnel of the same name are also sharing the same node. A component in this case is referring to something that can do some form of computation. So an AND gate is a component, a OR gate is a component, a NOT gate is a component, and so on. And so are NAND gates, you know, and so on. And propagational delay refers to the amount of time for a component to update its output ports, you know, after at least one of the input port is changed, this amount of time is called a propagational delay. And the following is the quote-unquote pseudocode um, that, you, that can describe, you know, how I updated, you know, these you know, cells in the spreadsheet. So let's go back and take a look at the description. So we start with a starting state, which typically would be unknown for everything. Make initial changes to one or more of the input pins. So that would correspond to uh, the bold phase um, change of state here. So these are the initial changes. And then we perform the following steps until there is no change from the last step. So the first thing is always going to use the ANSI step. So depending on the wiring or the node connectivity of the circuit, update all other ports of the same node connected to a port that has changed. So that's what we did you know, over here. 
um, this pin just you know, or this port just got changed it belongs to um, node 4 so we look up node 4 and go like hmm, this needs to be changed to the same thing which is a 1 we look at this one here it just got changed we look up this belongs to node 2 so as a result we go to node 2 over here change that to a 0 and there's another node 2 here and we also have to remember to change that one to a 0 as well so that's what um, the first step is referring to you know it's based on the node connectivity we do the updates and then the third the second step is you know we do we perform a pd step or after a propagational delay update the output ports of every component that has at least one of the input pin input port changed in the previous step so that's um, basically looking at um so that's a pd step here and the pd step is looking at the input inputs of your know, gates and in this case because you know the previous nc step just changed you know all of the inputs of the and gate a1 so we uh, look at the new output which is supposed to be zero since it is different from the unknown state here so that's why we have to um, specify is a zero um, so that's kind of a, a text description of how we track changes in a circuit and that's kind of your uh, your lab assignment is to do this except you know you have a circuit that is pre-built um, based on this part here so this is your starting point um, of doing your assignment and you can see that you know some of the input pin changes are already stated here and here and so on so your job is basically to go through the PD and alternate between the PD and the NC steps until you fill up this entire table um, it's not it's a little bit long okay you know, so there you know it goes all the way down here um, <coughs> so you have to um, make a copy of the um, circuit here so let me go back to here and talk about you know your um, assignment give me a second here and let me go back to module all right so uh, this is your assignment or this is your lab for today so let me go there and make sure it's open first and i'm not going to bother with uh, an access code in this case because uh, you have the entire day to do this so today is october 10th so you have the end you have until the end of today which is october 10th to complete the lab so we're gonna save and publish first okay so now you have access to it and then I'll go back in and explain what you need to do. All right. So now we go back into the lab here. And it's already published, but I'm going to go to build. So this way we can do a preview of what you need to do. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to go for a preview, which is reflecting what you should see when you are working on this. So the first step is to copy a Google Sheet. So the way you do it is to follow this link here, and then you know, that will open up the Google Sheet um, in one of your tabs. So you know, if I were you, I would right click on this and then say you know, open link in new window or new tab so you don't lose the instruction of the original one. So let's do that, open it in a new tab. All right, so we are looking at the same thing that we looked at last time, but since I'm the owner of this particular spreadsheet, I can change it um, when I'm here. But you cannot because you're not the owner. So the instruction also tells you what to do next. So you go to uh, File and then uh, make a copy to start the process of making your own copy. So that means you know when you go to the Google Sheet, you go to File and then you click on Make a Copy. Now you cannot just click Make a Copy because otherwise it will try to create the copy in my drive and you have no access to my drive so it's not going to work so what you need to do is to make sure that you specify where the folder is and typically you want to go all the way back to your drive and then work your way down to you know a subfolder that you want to use um, for this particular assignment but the whole point is okay in your case um, if you just go to make a copy and then you just click make a copy here it's not going to work you have to make sure that your folder is specified 
um, as your actual you know, drive and not using my drive. People are just going to be the default location of where the copy is going to be. All right, so getting back to the instruction here. So working out the rows, this is basically a repetition of the instruction that I have been talking about. So you can read all the instructions here and uh, work out the entire sheet. Okay, so after you work out the entire sheet, then what you need to do is to answer the questions. So there, there are a whole bunch of questions here. Um, you basically have to say, you know, which column you have to answer these questions. Uh, I'll just kind of read one you know, right here. Row 5 represents the very first step of the entire simulation. Check all the columns that are updated, not counting the value already provided in both phase uh, due to node connectivity. So you have to kind of specify you know, which ones are going to be changed because of the very first NC cycle. And as far as you're concerned, you are working with this sheet here. This is just an example. I'm going to change the name of this one just so that you know, you know this is an example, okay? Example. And the way, the one that you should be working on is SR Latch Sim, okay? That is going to be the, the uh, tab or sheet that you need to work on. So all of the other questions are very similar in nature. You know, um, a bunch of these is asking you which one turned into a one, which one turned into a zero. Um, and you know, these are multi-choice you know, questions, which means you, know, you have to only click, only select the ones that are the correct answer. If you select too many, it's going to you know, dock points. If you select not enough, it's going to dock points as well. Um, I think that's about it. Okay, you know, I'm going to exit the preview over here and let me go back to setting. Um, we are not going to use a, a an access code, so we'll go ahead and you know, remove that. <clears throat> um, I'm giving you a calculator, which I do not think you need. Um, it does keep the highest score, okay, as you, you know, keep attempting. Um, restrict student view, show points awarded, show items and questions, show your own response, indicate response as correct or incorrect. Okay, okay, I'm selecting all of these options, but I'm not going to say you know, show correct answer with incorrect response um, because you know, that kind of defeats the whole purpose because this is what you have to do in exam two. Um, so you really kind of need to master, you know, how to get this to work. Alrighty, so I think that's all we need here. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, all the changes are already updated and we can now do a return. And that's your lab for today. There's no access code, I just turned it off. Um, okay, I'm taking a look at the time. Um, well, since I don't have to ask, you know, are there any questions, you know, that usually take up a little bit of time in class. So that's why, you know, we are kind of done as far as the lecture is concerned. But I'm going to use up the next uh, 20 minutes, you know, just to kind of go over um, some of the notes here. <clears throat> the reason why we have to learn how to track changes within a circuit is because the circuits related to memory, which is you know, in this module, which is D flip flop and other basic memory devices. So these are, a lot of these circuits have some kind of a flyback. In other words, the output of a gate goes back to the input of another gate, but they are at the same level. So you, know, you can sort of say that it's a loop, but it's not exactly a loop. Um, so we talked about the SR latch already. We actually did all the analysis of the SR latch in the previous class. So that means you know, this portion here is already fully discussed. And I use um, a different way to explain you know, what happens when um, you change the state of one of the input ports and then just kind of using text to describe it. Your lab, okay, in case you haven't noticed, your lab actually has an SR latch. This is basically an SR latch. Um, you can see that these are corresponding to the same N1 gate. These are all corresponding to the same N2 gate. And then these two are corresponding to the output uh, output Q, output NQ, and then we have input S and then input R. 
So that's basically just your typical SR latch your circuit. So the analysis of this is already done in class. We are, we actually talked about this in class already. It's just that you know here we make the whole process very formalized, and then we just use a very mechanical way to kind of track the changes to the state of each port in the circuit. So getting back to the notes here, okay, right here. So the next circuit, you know, is a uh, D flip flop, which is built upon a uh, SR latch. So um, one thing you might want to do is to kind of read the description here and then make your own circuit, okay, so that you can also visualize what it is going to look like. So I'm going to, I'm looking at the time here, I think we still got time. So we'll go ahead and do it this, you know, uh, just make a actual circuit in Logisim, you know, for a D flip flop. All right, so I need to get to Logisim. All right, so the easy way to do it, I'm just going to have to specify the entire command line <coughs> option here. There we go. All right, and then we need to resize this so that the whole thing fits inside the uh, recorded portion. All right, so we want to unmaximize. And I believe it is already fitting within the confine of the recording screen. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be working out okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is to alternate between um, the text description and Logisim. So from the um, description in text here, we have a NOT gate, two, two input NAND gates, um, a SR latch. Uh, we have two input pins and two output pins over here. So the one thing that is kind of uh, curious is we need to have an SR latch SR, which is not built into uh, Logisim. So do not use the built-in uh, SR latch. So we're going to have to make our own SR latch first. So we go to project, we add a circuit, we call this um, SR latch. And this is where we actually make the SR latch. This is input S, this is input R, this is output Q, and this is output NQ. <clears throat> and then inside the circuit, we go to gates. We need two NAND gates. Okay, so I'm going to pick up one because the first thing I need to do is to change the size to narrow and then change the number of input to two. And then we make a copy of that. Okay, so because we need two of these. So we'll put one over here and then put one over here and just to make the circuit look nice you know I can kind of move the uh, location of the pins a little bit like that all right and I will also label these things okay just so that we know which one is which one so here's the input s this is input r this is output q okay we actually did this circuit already in the previous class um, I just did it in on my tablet, so we were not able to simulate you know the work, inner workings of the circuit here. So now we connect this, connect that, connect that, connect that, and then this needs to go all the way back here. And we can do that just by doing this. And then this needs to go all the way back here, so we can do that too. But, you know, if I want to avoid the you know, overlapping or flying over wires, I'm going to fly all the way back, way back here. And then we can go straight to here. All right, so we got our SR latch. We changed to the appearance. And, you know, I just like to, you know, label stuff, okay? You know, just so that this way I know which, one is, which pin is which pin. So we have S, R, uh, Q first and then NQ, and then just kind of move the uh, labels to the right place. That's just for you know me you know, remembering what is what. 
So we got Q to put over here, and then and Q goes down here. All right. So here's our SL latch. And now we can go back to main and actually work on the circuit of main. All right, so let's go back to the text description here. We need two input pins, you know, one is D and one is EN, okay? So we'll go for the input pin D, which stands for data, and then the other input pin EN, which stands for enable. And then we have two output pins, Q and NQ. You know, those are the actual uh, state being remembered by this particular device. So we have Q and then we have NQ over here. And then we go back to the circuit. Uh, we need uh, a NOT gate and two uh, NAND2 gates here. Okay, so we go back here and I'm just gonna steal, you know, these two uh, NAND gates because we, because it's already here, so might as well. So we do a control C, which is a copy. We go to main and do a control B to copy the circuit over here, like so. Um, we also need a NOT gate. So NOT gate is right here. We just pull one out here. And then what we need to do is to name these things, okay? So we have this one called, being called N1. And this one is N2, you know, N for NAND gate in this case. So this is our N2. The NOT gate has its own name of just N. Okay, so we look over here, we label it as just N. <clears throat> and then what else do we need? I believe that's all we need. So those are all the components, and now we need to add the nodes. So each one of the circuit add node call is corresponding to, in the uh, spreadsheet, is corresponding to one of these ID. So every node has its own ID, and then the individual columns of the same ID co correspond to the ports that are interconnected. So now we go back to the design here, and uh, we have to go back to the description here. There we go. So we need um, D to connect to N1.in0 and also connecting to N.in. Okay, so... Um, all right, so I'm not gonna make this you know, circuit look nice, okay? Uh, so N1 is this one, N in zero is the first one. So, oops, I need, I'm drawing a wire over here. That's one, and then here's the other one. So this is one node, okay, which is represented by a node ID in the spreadsheet. <coughs> so we are done with this one, and then we move on to the next one which connects from the EN input pin to the to the other input pin of N1 and also to the first input pin of N2. Okay, so we now make a connection from here to the other input pin of N1, the second input pin, and it is also supposed to connect to the first input pin of N2. So we just make a connection like that. All right, and then here comes the third node. Uh, which connects the output of the NOT gate to the second input of the uh, second NAND gate. So, um, right. well, I'm not too concerned about making this look nice. So that's that. And I forgot about the SR latch entirely. So because we have, we have a SR latch SR, so now we go to SR latch, which we just made, and put it into the circuit. And we can always name it to, you know, SR, because you know, that's the name that we used um, and you can see the SR is really kind of somewhere in here. It's not easy to read it, but it's there. All right, so now what do we do is we take the output of N1 and connect it to the S input of SR. And you can see it's becoming kind of difficult to read all this stuff. So I'm gonna go back to this circuit here and change the appearance a little bit. A little bit. Um, I'm just gonna put the labels outside of the box because inside the box is already the name of the uh, component, so that makes it kind of difficult to read uh, the labeling of the pins. So I'm just going to make it outside, go back to main, and you can see how the labels are now outside. So we go back to the description of the circuit, and we connect the output of N1 to the S input of SR. So that will be this one, connecting to over here, 
and then we have um, the output of N2 connecting to R as the input of uh, the SR latch. So we have this and going here. Oops, there we go. <clears throat> and then we have SR.Q connecting to the Q output pin. There we go. And then we have the uh, SRNQ connected to the NQ output pin. So there we go. All right, so the circuit is now done. And you might notice that we have a little bit of a problem because, you know, why do we have these red wires? That's because, you know, the initial setup of the SR latch is really just to say, maintain your current state. But what current state are we talking about? This SR latch was never initialized. So as a result, we do not know the um, actual state of the, of the gate here. And that's why the output cannot be determined. So this is actually normal. This is called a D flip-flop because it is one of the simplest devices where you can specify this is what I want you to remember, which is you know, corresponding to the D port. And then uh, the EN port is saying, do it now, okay? Um, or as long as EN is a one, whatever you present as D is gonna mirror as Q and then NQ is always gonna be the negation of Q itself. Okay, so let's check out how this works. So the first thing we want to notice is as long as EN is a zero, you can flip your D all you want and nothing happens, okay? On the other hand, if you flip EN to a one, then as long as EN is a one, the state of the D input pin is going to be mirrored at the output pin Q. So that means, you know, as long as EN is a one, I'm not touching it, I can now change the D you can see how Q is, refl is uh, basically copying the value of D and I can change it back and I can do it all day long, okay? But once I have your know, Q being the state that I want, let's say it's a one, I can now turn off the device. We are basically turning the EN or the enable to a zero. And then at this point, I can change D all I want, but the state is already remembered as a, uh, as a one in this case, and it's not gonna be changed. So this is what we call a D flip-flop. Um, it, D stands for data, okay, but it's called a D flip-flop. It is um, it's made out of uh, NAND gates, uh, a single NOT gate, which can be, you know, we can get rid of this NOT gate here by changing uh, the way we configure the NAND gate, but it's good to kind of spell it out because, you know, that's also spelled out in the uh, circuit description. And then we also need a, an SR latch. So this is why we have to talk about the SR latch first, because it is a component um, that we use in all of the other designs. Um, let me check the time. So I think this is enough material. Um, and then the other thing that you can consider doing um, before Thursday, because Thursday is gonna be like this, you know, where I record the lecture, is you might want to try this out, okay? Apply the um, propagation analysis, okay? Apply this kind of a spreadsheet, but you know, apply it to this slightly more complex you know, circuit. So you repeat basically what I just did, right? You basically just go like, okay, I'm gonna change uh, E, change D, make sure it's a zero, enable EN to be a one, and then just kind of see whether you can track the changes to the state of all of the components, you know, the same way that we uh, track, you know, K2 in a, in a circuit K2 <coughs> as an example today. And then you can also, you know, once your know, EN is a one, you can also change your D from zero to one and then see if your, your know, spreadsheet can track all of these changes, not only to the final state, which is, which are the Q and the NQ, but also, you know, how the changes got propagated along the way through, you know, the uh, various gates N1, N2. And then this time you can look at the SR latch as one single component and use the properties of an SR latch to uh, simplify, you know, the tracking. Um, so that's what I would do on Thursday, okay, is I would go through this circuit here and actually, you know, uh, describe the propagation changes or the propagation of changes within the circuit. Uh, so that way we are reapplying what we do today in the lab, but on a more complex circuit, which is this one here.
it also helps if you make the circuit too you know just so that you can kind of click on the pins and kind of watch you know how the uh, circuit behaves as you change the uh, input pins so i believe this is um, enough material for today uh, so we got the lab that is due at the end of today we also have you know some of the kind of concept stuff and on top of that as usual it is important to read the module okay so you really should be reading uh, the module you know, starting with the SR latch um, and before uh, on Thursday we'll be talking about the D flip-flop but we'll be analyzing you know how changes get propagated within a D flip-flop on Thursdays so that means you know understanding you know how the D flip-flop usually works on its own is going to be it's going to be helpful it's going to be important um all right so i think that's all i need to do for today we got a lecture we got the lab the lab is due at the end of today i know this lab is going to take a little bit more time than usual but since you know we have the end of today and you can always refer to this example here to kind of uh, get an idea of how uh how the table works now there's a reason why this one is color coded and this one is not color coded. Now you can see you know, how many nodes we have in this case. We have zero, one, two, three. So there are only four nodes in this particular design. In this particular example, which is the K2 circuit in a carry look ahead adder, it has nine, well, actually I take it back. It has eight nodes. So with eight nodes, color coding is not going to work very well because most people cannot differentiate um, after we have more than you know, five or six colors. You know, then the colors start to resemble each other and using the color code is not going to work. Um, but for your actual you know, um, lab instruction here, um, you know, color coding does work because we only have uh, four different nodes. So I can easily choose your know, four different colors that will that can differentiate from each other. Uh, for people who are colorblind, I think the green and the blue may not be uh, easy to differentiate. So I still have the node ID here for those people who cannot rely on the color to differentiate you know, which node connects to, I mean, which to differentiate between the nodes. All right, so that is that. So I think we are done for the recording and I'm going to send this to you and I'm going to you know, change the instruction a little bit too you know because I just want to make sure that it's super clear that if the output of a component does not change we do not write the number in the cell so I'm going to add that you know, instruction to both the module itself to this description here but also to the assignment or the lab instructions just so that you know we kind of you know know what to do when the output of a component does not change after a propagation or delay all right so i'm going to stop the recording and then have it uploaded and get it sent to you by announcement